Hey, today we're starting a brand new series of messages that will be going for the entire month of March, and we're kicking it off today. And the message is entitled Forward Living. Somebody say Forward Living. living. Come on, say it again. Forward Forward Living. And if you've been with us at the beginning of the year, we uh, gave our theme for the entire year, 2019, is forward. We are moving forward. We made a decision that we are going forward. Somebody say forward. forward. And we are making a decision that every area of our life, and our marriage, and our family, and our home, and our health, and our relationships, and our finances, we're going to move forward. We're going forward in those areas. We're not going to just get stuck in a rut, stay where we've always been, keep going around the mountain over and over and over, but we're going to think forward. We're going to live forward. We're going to move forward. We're going forward. Somebody say forward. Forward. And so today I want to introduce this new series of subject of forward living, living forward, not just in yesterday, Not just in today, but living forward. Thinking about tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Amen. Sometimes we're always just full of the past or we're full of the present. And if you're not careful, all of that robs you from thinking about the future, thinking about tomorrow. And so I believe in this series of messages, I would highly encourage you. You know, they say the average statistics are that a church member, somebody that is committed to going to church, is uh, in service or in church at least once or twice a month is the average uh, church member. So if you go more than once a month or twice a month, you're above average. Amen. And some of you are well above average. Amen. And I appreciate that, but I want to encourage you because I believe this would be one of the most um, meaningful or relative series of subjects of message that we'll share the entire year. I believe it will uh, be a spinning point, if you would, or a, a, a diving board into everything else that God has for us here at Destiny for 2019. Amen. We're going forward. Amen. Uh, if, if I want to live forward, we, we gave our foundation scripture for the entire year. And so you'll hear us say it, read it over and over and over. Because faith to do anything uh, has to come by hearing. The Bible says that faith comes to me by hearing and hearing and hearing, not having heard. So i got to have a repetition of hearing the same thing over and over and over. As soon as you think... You've already heard it. You've not heard it enough. Amen? And uh, you always want to know why you got to tell your kids over and over and over because faith to do comes by hearing. So if you're like, I'm just tired of repeating myself, don't do that. Because faith to get in them to do the very thing you're asking them to do, it comes to them by a repetition of hearing. And the same thing over and over. Amen. Same way in our relationships with our wives and our families and every area of our life. It's like if you hear you can't over and over and over and over and over and over enough, you'll start believing you can't. A lot of people never get anywhere in life because they say, well, I was told when I was a little kid this and this and this and this. Next thing you know, they start believing everything that was spoken over them. And now they're living in that life that was spoken. So we got to make sure we're not just speaking our words, but we're speaking God's word. Because the Bible says that his word, there's health and life to those that find it. I said his word, the Bible says, is health and life to those that find it. Who today wants health? Come on, you want to be healthy? You want to live healthy? Who wants to have a life? You just don't want to live. You want to have a life. Come on, who wants to have a life? Something that you enjoy. You know, they say the average person in America is not enjoying their life. One of the latest reports is the average person, male or female, in America is not enjoying 
their life. You know, there's probably people in other countries that uh, would trade positions. Especially people that are having to stand in line for food. And they don't know if they're going to get food that day. They may wait there all day and then be told, hey, we're out. We don't have nothing. There's things happening right now in different parts of our world that people are going days, if not weeks, without any food. All of their getting is water. So, you know, it's sad to say that the average American is not enjoying their life. They say over 60% of Christians are not enjoying their life. You know, there's more divorce going on in the church today, not destiny, the church global, (laughs) than there is. It's almost like there's more divorce going on in the church than there is in the world. And what I'm about to get into for the next several weeks is the number one reason why divorce is happening in the God's house as well as outside of God's house. And it has to do with people's finances. People are divorcing more today in church and outside the church over money than they are uh, somebody, uh, I forgot the word I'm looking for. What, what's the word you call if you sleep around, you sleep, you do something? Adultery. Woo! Adultery. That's from the marriage ministry. She said that with a little swag. Adultery. Uh, You know, uh, uh, there's more people getting divorced over financial pressure and arguing and fussing and fighting than there is somebody doing something against their commitment to each other. And that is really sad to say. I would, think, I would think that money would be the thing you wouldn't fight over, but you'd be fighting more over those things. And, but they say money, financial pressure, that stress and that worry and that arguing over one spending, one not spending, one having more than the other, all of that debate, all of that frustration is the leading cause to, I was looking for the word infidelity. That's the word I was looking for. Ding, 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 ding. My elevator just hit the top floor. Infidelity. It's, 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 they, the root is financial pressure is the very root that begins to springboard all of these other things that happen in a marriage. They say one of the leading reasons why kids want to move out of their home and live on their own and do their own thing, live their own life, is because of financial pressure. They're either not able to have the things they see other kids have or enjoy the life that they see other people enjoying. And because financial pressure in the world you and I are living in today, kids are wanting to leave home. They're they're not wanting to stay. They're not wanting to be faithful, not wanting to be committed. You know, they say one of the leading causes... Of people leaving God's house is financial pressure. And yet, God's house is the place that most Christians don't want to hear money mentioned. Pastor, you can talk about everything else, but don't talk about the money. Well, I'm not the type to hold back of what I believe is true. And so over the next several weeks, I'm going to talk to us of the Bible instruction scriptures of what I truly believe works. I mean, I'm fully persuaded. I'm not, I'm not, well, you know what, maybe it's good for some other. No, I'm, I'm fully convinced and fully persuaded that this is God's plan for every believer. It's God's plan. It's God's will. And I submit to you that let's just say if we could get our finances in order and we could drop the divorce rate at least in destiny that where we could help be a light and example to other families and Christians 
in the country or in our city and our community around here, if we could just drop it by 10%, would it not be beneficial to us to understand God's plan for financial prosperity? If we could just drop it 10%, if we could save one family, one marriage, would it be worth it? Because I know you'd agree for me to preach on alcoholism, that if, if we could get one person delivered from alcohol, they wouldn't have a car accident and kill five other people. You'd say, Pastor, if there's any way you could preach on that, then we could just stop one family from losing their life from somebody drinking and driving. It'd be worth you preaching it. I mean, if we had anybody sick and we preached on healing and God's word plan on healing and divine health, if we could get one person healed and, and not having to die before their time or whatever the case, you and I would agree that it, that's, please preach about it, Pastor, because if we can just get one person. I knew it'd get quiet on this particular subject, but it's okay. I'm fully persuaded. I'm not needing your help, your amen, your own me to get me persuaded because I'm fully, I've lived it. I see it. I watch God do it. I've seen it in my own personal life. I've seen it in this church. And I've seen it in the people in this congregation see God do it. Amen. Genesis 26, verse 12 and 13. I'm just going to quote it to us because it's our theme scripture. It says, Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold return. And Isaac waxed great and went forward. Somebody say he went forward. See, Isaac did something. Isaac just didn't set on what he had. Isaac, in the time of of a famine in the time that didn't seem to be right, Isaac started giving. Isaac started planting. He started doing something that what God had given him, he started doing something. And the Bible says, and God blessed him. And he received in the same year a hundred times, a hundredfold. If, if giving and prosperity and success and bountiful return was not God's will for a person's life, then why would the Bible say God blessed Isaac and Isaac reaped in the same year a hundredfold? I mean, if it was against the order of God, if it's not for God's children, then why would God bless Isaac for sowing? Don't shout me down as a preacher. So good, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. But that's our theme scripture that Isaac would have never seen a harvest if he would have never done something with what he had. And I believe Isaac had to be a believer. I believe he, had, he was a believer. In forward living, there's two things that I want us to understand in this series, and that is number one, it is God's will for you to live a blessed life. Somebody say, it is God's will for me to live a blessed life. The, the word blessed means an empowerment to succeed or excel or be successful. It's an endowment, a, a, a special Ability that God puts upon his children for them to do well in life, to exceed, to excel. The blessing is not the car, it's not the house, it's not the job, it's not the career. But the blessing of God on one's life will, the effects of the blessing, let me say it that way, will cause you to have the job, the career, the tuition money for your son's education, your child's education, whatever you need and more, the effects of the blessing of God on your life. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's straight preaching in here. He's straight preaching. Number two, 
It's living in the beyond state. It's forward living is number one, understanding it's God's will for me to have a blessed life. And number two, it's God's will that I don't just live in the present, but I live in the beyond state. That, that it's more than enough. It's not just the enough state, it's more than enough. I've made my own little definition. It may make sense to you. It may not. It's the first time in uh, 19 years, well, actually 29 years, uh, that I've ever typed my own message. It's brand new, front and back, brand new. Why are you saying that? Because I made a decision this year would be a grow year for me, that I, I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow spiritually and one way to grow spiritually is you got, if you want to go where you've never gone, you've got to begin to do what you've never done. If not, years ago I saw this Charlie Brown uh, little cartoon and it was like they had like Charlie Brown, this little story was like this person's uh, foot was nailed to the floor and so since it was nailed to the floor, they just... You know, that's how some Christians are. They're just, they want to go forward, but they're stuck. And all they do is just go round and round and round and round. God don't want you to go round and round. He wants you to go forward. So I wrote my own little definition down. I hope this makes sense. If not, it's, it's just my own typing. So uh, forward living is living a blessed life and beyond blessed life with the heart that I live to give, I don't give to get. The problem in the Christian church today is we have somehow been bamboozled. We've been bewitched to think that God is a lottery machine. He's a slot machine that I can give and I'm going to get. And so my whole motivation is giving to get. God's not a give, get God. He wants you to have forward living. He wants you to be forward thinking, forward living, that you're living to give. That I want to be one that lives to give, not live to get. If, if you're living to get or giving to get, you're that person with like Charlie Brown, the toe, and you're just round and round and round and round and round. But if you're living to give, you're, you're thinking about tomorrow, you're thinking about next week, thinking about next year, you're, you're forward thinking. The best way I knew how, if I get some help up here, Danny or, or, or Alex to help me is... I'll, Got a little illustration here of the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof is his. For any life to go forward, my point number one today, I only got three points and I'm going to let you out. Well, my first point to go forward is it takes two legs. If you're going to move forward in life, if you're going to forward living a, a life has to have two legs to get anywhere. And the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof belongs to him. Everything in and on the earth belongs to God. And everything I have. So the two legs that we're going to be teaching on is in this blessed life and beyond blessed life is number one is understanding generosity. My, one leg is generosity leg. And the other leg we're going to talk about is stewardship. A lot of people don't like the stewardship. They don't like the generosity leg. But if you'll stay with us for the next couple of weeks, you'll get something. Because giving is not giving to get. It's giving. It's living to give. And I got to understand, when I'm generous, I'm the most like God I will ever be. How many of y'all believe God's generous? 
Do you believe there's a lot of Christians who don't believe God's generous because, well, he ain't helped me and I got bills and I got my lights cut off and I asked him, not, the next thing you know, I don't got enough and I'm barely making it and if God's so good, why ain't he that? But, but well, we're going to help you get through that. But he is generous because we're all breathing right now. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and make sure they're breathing. Just touch them. You're breathing, you're breathing. And you know God's allowing you and I to inhale and exhale right now. We're sitting here breathing, and, and I'm going to tell you something. I don't deserve God to be letting me breathe. And some of you don't deserve, well, all of you don't deserve. I know there's a handful, well, I do, because I've been real good. Well, how about B.C. before Jesus? But we're still, God allows us, that's pretty generous that God allows you and I to breathe. But this picture here is God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof is His. Alex, I need you to hold one of those cups. And some people is, here's all they want. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. Bread of heaven, fill me till I want no more. Fill my cup and fill it up and make me whole. Now you can stay there and that will be a blessed life. But God, what you're going to learn in this series is he wants you to live in the beyond state. Living forward living is living beyond the blessing, living in too much overflow. I told you you need a towel. He goes, I didn't come here to get wet. And uh, please get it off the floor there because that's going to ruin our stage. <laughs> but I couldn't think of a better illustration than to get us to understand many of us are just living in, well, I'm doing okay. At least I'm paying my bills or I'm barely getting there. At least I got a little bit. No, no, no. God wants you to live in the beyond state. And then we're going to deal with, because there are people that gave. Well, I'm a giver. I've given, but I still have needs. I, I'm still in debt. I, I, I've been giving, I've been giving, I've been doing it, but I'm still not having enough to take care of it. It's because the two legs I'm talking about today is, one, it's being generous, being a giver, that you are blessed to give. You're blessed to return to God. It's all His. And number two is understanding the stewardship principle. That I don't own anything. I'm just a steward of what He's entrusted me. It's not mine to begin with. God has just entrusted me. The job I have, he's entrusted me. This ain't my church. This ain't my job. It's not even my anointing. It's his anointing. It's his call. It's his vision. I'm just a steward of it. That's good. We're good to go. Every one of us here, those children don't belong to you. They're just, you're just the steward of them. He's just allowing you to parent them. It, they came from God. He's the creator and maker of all things. The problem is a lot of us are givers. And we help people. And we'll give to the church. And we'll help his kingdom. But we've not understood the stewardship principle. We don't understand that uh, uh, if I don't see a need, then I'm not going to do it. Well, if you're just a steward and it all belongs to God, and it does, then you understand that it's not mine to vote on. 
Oh, I can see I need to work on it a little bit. If you look with me in Genesis chapter 12. Forward living is choosing to be a be, do, and have what God wants you to have and his plan for you and your family to have. It's not, it's not all just about having a blessed wallet or a blessed checkbook. God wants you to be a steward. He wants you to be generous. In Genesis chapter 12, if you look at verse 2, it says, God told Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and make you a blessing. Think about what God told Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to Bless you, I'm, I'm going to make your name great, and I'm going to make you a blessing. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof belongs to him. So everything, any good that comes out of me, he did it. Anything great come out of me, he did it. If my name is, means anything to anybody, I didn't do it, he did it. If my children think anything good of me, it's not something I did. It's something he did or allowed me to do. But see, we don't realize that the reason some people, they don't understand that the two legs that it takes to live the blessed life and the beyond blessed life, that forward living, they don't realize that it requires me to be generous to be a giver, number one, to God's house, to his work, to his plan. God wants to bless me so I can be a blessing. And then he wants me to be a good steward because a steward is simply me understanding that he owns it all. What's in that checking account's not mine. It's his. He's just allowing me to manage it, to watch over it. My house is something the Lord gave me. He opened the door. He calls the loan officer to not look at my credit and to just say, I must have pulled somebody else's credit up, like approved. The day you start saying, that's my house, that's my money, that's my car. Be careful because the Lord will remind you quickly whose it is. The Bible even instructs me as a pastor, says, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. If it's his house, he'll build it. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, he wants to bless me so I can be a blessing. See, being a blessing is that living in the beyond state. Just being blessed, that's the wrong motive. That's the wrong heart. God didn't tell Abraham, I'm blessing you just so you can be blessed. You and your kids, y'all can have plenty. Y'all can have more than enough. Y'all never have to worry, never have to lack. He said, the whole reason I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a great nation means that, that you're going to be able to affect a lot of people. The whole reason I'm going to make your name great is I'm going to raise you up with influence because those with influence has power. And those that have power can lead a country. They can lead people. And the reason I'm going to bless you that there'll be a cause and effect on your life that people will see greatness in you and financial success and no lack in you, but you'll never say that you got it all on your own. You will always say, if the Lord hadn't gave it to me, if the Lord hadn't blessed these hands, if the Lord hadn't blessed these feet, I wouldn't be anything. Preach, preacher. I'm trying. I would highly encourage you to be very careful. Yes. 
of thinking what you have is yours. Because if you're a child of God, God will remind you shortly that it's not yours. He's just allowing you to be the trustee, the steward of it. And how many of you know the owner of something, if they, have, if they need it, they can ask for it? Right? My kids told me, you know, well, they're going to move out. They're going to do this. They're going to do that when they get a certain age. I'm like, oh, you know, it's all, I mean, it's no problem. It's all good. I'm like, you see that bed you let stain in? That's my bed. Is all that furniture in there? They're like, oh, no, we take no. You ain't taking no. You got to go buy your own when you leave there. That's, that's mine. Now, I may, I may loan it to you and let you be a steward, a, a trustee over it. That car you're driving, I'm making the payment on it. I'm putting the gas in there. That credit card you got in your pocket, I'm paying that bill on that credit card right there. <laughs> I'm just letting you be a steward of it. Don't think it's yours. See, the problem with Christians is God brings us out of darkness into the light. And the longer we've been in the light, we forgot about the darkness, and now we think we got ourselves in the light. Number two, because you're probably asked this question, so I want to go ahead and address it at the beginning of this series. Why talk about money? I mean, Reverend, you can talk about any other subject, but why are you talking about money in church? Some may say, Pastor, why... Why would you talk about money? That ain't gonna get that ain't gonna draw people. We're trying to build the church. Number one, it's because I believe the Bible. And I believe that it will help you in your everyday life. In other words, I preach on marriage. Because I believe it'll help your marriage. I preach on prayer because I believe prayer will change your life. I preach on many areas of the Bible because I believe it's God's plan and God's word. And the Bible says if you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. So why would I hold back truth in an area that right now is the, one of the leading causes of divorce, not in the world, in God's house. It's the number one reason why young people, teenagers, don't want to join the ministry when they grow up. They want to join the military. They want to be a doctor. They want to be a lawyer. And most of them either want to be some songwriter, a rapper, a famous singer, or an athlete. And the only reason is it's not because of, of just watching people do it. It's seeing them with the financial increase on their life is the driving point for them to want to be that. It's sad to say we got lawyers that were called to be missionaries. Sad to say we got people in the business market, in the business field, that were called to serve God and minister to people in foreign land, but yet they're caught up in the financial gain. They said more yes to that because they could see what it could do for them, and they're running from God. Now, I'm not saying that you're not supposed to have do those things because I believe God calls lawyers, calls doctors, calls school teachers, truck drivers. I'm talking about the heart. I'm talking about the decision, the reason why I was one. I was like, Lord, please don't make me minister. I don't want to be a preacher because every preacher I've seen could barely pay their bills. Driving an old hoopty. 
No, seriously, I, uh, most preachers when I was growing up, they had to have, people had to bring them lunch every Sunday. Some, some lady in the church had to bring them lunch for the pastor to eat. Because they had a mentality that the poorer they are, the more spiritual they are. And the people in the church had that same understanding because people follow leadership. And so the people thought, well, let's, we want them to stay spiritual. Let's keep him poor. <laughs> let's keep him so poor he'll realize he needs us. It ain't us that need him. We, he needs us. <laughs> See, I want to reverse. I'd love to see kids in this church have a desire to be a minister or a missionary because they see not just financial increase, they see the best life a person could possibly have and live. There should be a bigger hand clap and amen than that. Because I've seen the other side of it. I've seen people with great business success and their children want nothing to do with it. Don't want nothing to do with the, the business. And the, and the business has made the family millions of dollars over the years. But the kids want nothing to do with it because the business controlled the family. The family did not control the business. I've seen preacher's kids want nothing to do with the ministry. Because the ministry ran the family. The family didn't run the ministry. Why talk about money? Number two, because I believe that it's God's plan to get you in the beyond state, the blessed beyond state. That you don't just have your needs met, but you have enough for yours to be taken care of and you have more left over to give to God's house to support his work or to help somebody in need or to help a stranger to be able to help somebody to pay it forward at the cashier or wherever that you're able to not just be a blessing in God's house first, but you're able to be a blessing in the community. You're able to understand the cause and effect outside of your own life. And a question I have to you, have you ever read the Bible? Jesus preached and talked about money and possessions. 16 out of 38 parables Jesus dealt with in the New Testament about money and possessions. Some may think, well, Pastor, you're doing it because you need my money. Well, let me address that straight up in your grill. <laughs> I don't need your money. I don't need it. I don't, I don't need it. And people's been here long enough. We started this ministry over 19 years ago. Emptied our 401k over 40 something thousand dollars. We emptied it. It was our retirement plan. We emptied it and put it in the ministry. And we've seen God triple that, put it back, and bless us beyond measure. I, I don't need your money. Well, you need my money to build the church. No. Because your money didn't build this church. God's money built the church. This is, let me remind you, this is the Lord's house. This is the Lord's work. I'm just a gatekeeper. I'm just the broom man. I'm just a steward in his house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those that are laboring, they labor in vain.
Amen? Amen. Mark, the sixth chapter. Matthew, sorry, Matthew, the sixth chapter. Why did Jesus talk about money? Why did he 16 parables out of 38 parables, almost half of his time he spent talking about money and possessions and how your, your stewardship of them? Why would Jesus do that? My question to you is, did Jesus need their money? Was Jesus trying to get their money? Was that what he was about to... Get the people's money? No, we know that. Jesus wasn't after the people's money. Jesus was after the people's heart. Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 21st verse. Jesus says this. For wherever your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Your heart may not be there yet. Jesus says, but it will be. Because I've said it and been guilty of it before, and I've heard other pastors say it. They've reversed it and said, for where your heart is, your treasure will be. And the more I thought about it in preparing this message, I realized, no, that's not true. Because Jesus dealt with that if you will give your treasure to God, your heart will soon follow. Husbands, if you're out of love with your wife, give them your money. That brand new truck or car you're driving, she's still driving that old raggedy thing, get out of it. Give her the keys. You'll follow her all the way to work. Make sure she parks it away from other cars. You'll, 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 you, there's no, your heart will go. She'll be like, why are you following me? I just want to make sure you don't park next to me. It's going to dent the car. Jesus knows that if you're not going to give to him, your heart will never be with him. Today, my friends, I'm not after your money. I want your heart. Should be a better hand clap than that. Because according to the scripture, if your heart if your money is here, your heart will be here. Hello? Same in your children, in your family, in your home. Whatever you treasure the most, and you give that, your heart will be there. It may not be there. That's what I loved about getting this revelation of this is Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be. So your heart may not be in it to start, but it will be if you will give God the treasure. Hope you're getting something out of that. Somebody that is, is generous but not a good steward, we call them tight. I used to think my son was tight. He's the only one out of my children and all of us that always has money. Chaston always has money. Always got money. We're like, Chaston's got money. He's always forever have money. Michaela borrows from him. Addison to borrow from him. I've even borrowed from him. I mean, everybody borrows from Chaston. He's tight. <laughs> he's a good steward. I said that backwards a while ago. He's a good steward, but he's not generous. I used to think that. But the only reason he's got money 
is he's such a steward, he, he's such control of his money, that's why he has money, but the other leg he needs to walk on, or that I was thinking he need to walk on, is he needs to learn how to be generous because God blesses us to be a blessing. I got to wrap it up. Then all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a service with my pastor, and they're taking up an offering, and um, people get up and say, well, Bishop, I want to give you this, or da 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 And next thing I know, they ask for, you know, somebody to give $1,000, and Chasson stands up and gives $1,000. And I'm like, it better not be on my credit card. <laughs> because you ain't a steward of my money, you're a steward of what God's entrusted you. But you know, I come to find out that I watch him buy people's lunch, take care of people, be a blessing to people. And I begin to understand that he's not tight. He has money because he's such a good steward, he realizes what he has isn't his. And it's his job to be a blessing and to steward what God's entrusted him. My third point, and I may not get to all of it, but we got several weeks. Anybody get anything out of this? My third point is being a blessing. There's two reasons why God wants us blessed. Somebody say, being a blessing. Being a blessing. Is that an action word? I didn't do good in English, but an action word or it's a verb. Don't even know what verb means, but sounds cool. That <laughs> means action. An action word. Being means action. Faith without works is dead. Amen. Two reasons why God wants us blessed. Number one, believe it or not, it's because he loves us. He told Abraham, Abraham, if you'll go where I'm telling you to go, I'm going to make your name great, I'm going to make you a great nation, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing. Number two, is because he wants us to be a blessing. And i got to realize and understand that if God says he's going to bless me and make me a blessing, that it is okay, hear me, hear me, hear me, it is okay to ask God for the blessing. It's okay to expect the blessing. It's okay to expect God and ask God to bless you in such a way that the effects and the cause and effect on your life of the blessing, you will be able to be a blessing not only to your children but your children's children not only to your church but to other people around you so I believe the first belongs to God you know the scripture says that every time the people assembled to worship every time Study it out. Just Google it. Search it. Every time they assembled to worship, the people brought an offering. They never assembled to worship God without preparing an offering. Because the offering in the scripture, the reason Jesus had to talk about it, is the offering always represents me. The tithe we're going to talk about that later, belongs to God. That's his. So I'm never giving God the tithe. I'm returning it. I'll deal with that later. But The reason it says every time they assembled, they brought offerings when they came to worship. Because offerings is what's left over for you. And when you start giving God to his house what's 
left and entrusted to you of your part. It's a whole nother level with God. And I triple, double dog dare you to try it. It's a whole nother, it, it opens the door to supernatural realm in your life when you don't just return that's what's already his and think you've done something, but you get extravagant in your offering. When you come to worship, you prepare something that's been entrusted to you, not bringing what's his, that's great. But when you start pulling together, God, this is just a way I want to thank you today. Amen. I want to close with this. We'll talk about it more later. First Chronicles chapter 4. All I ask you to do if you're watching online or here today, even a visitor, try to come at least between now and the end of March four times or get the CD or something and listen to it. Make sure you're not distracted before you judge, before you put your mouth on anything I'm talking about today. Listen to it. Just take a couple weeks and listen. Amen? First Chronicles 4, verse 9. It says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. I don't have a lot of time, but I have seconds. But if you would take a moment and read, start in chapter first, chapter first Chronicles, just start at the beginning and read, you'll, you'll see all the way through, all the way up to to this in chapter 4, verse 9, you'll see the lineage talked about. Even in chapter 3, it starts with the family of David. And it starts with David, then his sons were born, and this one and that one, and the firstborn, and and then their sons. And then it's it's given a a history of, of, of... brothers and sisters and their kids and their kids and their kids and just generation after generation and just all the way down it's just given a lineage and for some unknown reason and even after it God causes the writer to pause on verse 9 and and, and instead of saying and Jabez's brother says pause and stops and says and Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. On all the other brothers and all the other chapters, you don't see the writer stopping and God drawing attention to anybody else, but all of a sudden he draws attention and says, and Jabez, out of everybody, was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called him Jabez, which that name in the Greek means pain. Sorrow maker, painful. Verse 10 says, And Jabez called on God of Israel. It's one thing to be told something, you're, oh, you're sorry, you're painful, you brought me a lot of pain. To not allow those things to affect you. And I don't care what you're facing, what you're going through, what somebody said about you, where you are financially, where you are in your marriage today. I don't care how bad it is because i got good news for you. If you'll call on the God that is a forward living God, the God that wants to bless you and make you a blessing, if you'll call and ask him, God, I ask you to bless me indeed. Come on, somebody. Don't live in where you've been. Don't live what you've been facing. Don't live what you've been going through. It's your day. It's your time to have forward thinking, forward living.
I got to slow down. I got three more, two more services to go. Let me wrap it up. The Bible says, And Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and that you would enlarge my territory. Be careful if you pray that prayer. Because as soon as you ask him to enlarge your territory, he's about to take you places you can never go by yourself. He's about to raise you up. He's about to do for you that you can never do for yourself. Sweep me away with you. He says, you would bless me indeed. You would enlarge my territory. And this is my prayer, that you would keep your hand on me. God, I can't do it without you. Oh, God, I need your hand. I need your touch. I need you day in, day out. God, never leave me. God, keep your hand on me. I can't do it without you. I can't decide without him. I can't steward my life, my money without him. I need his hand on me. Go and do this, do that. Go here, go there. Bless this. Then my other prayer is that you would keep me from evil. How many of y'all know God, the Bible says when you're a tither, he rebukes the devourer? That's why God blessed Jabez. The Lord said, and God granted Jabez his prayer. If God is not into the blessing business and you live in beyond blessed life that you could be a blessing, then why would God bless Jabez and grant Jabez his prayer? Why would God stop and make the writer draw a conclusion and say, now Jabez was more honorable than his brother? I submit to you today, could it be that he was recognized more honorable to God? Because Jabez didn't let his condition define him. He didn't let what people said about him. He didn't let the trouble and the pain that he caused decide his destiny. He was going to have forward living. He was going to move forward. And he knew that ain't nothing good going to come out of his life if he didn't have God's hand and God's blessing and God's touch and God keeping him from evil. Would you stand? Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Oh, Lord. I need you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I need you. That should be your prayer. That should be your cry. I need you, Lord. God, don't, don't let me think what I have is mine. What I've saved, what I've planned. Don't let me think I, it's all mine, Lord. It's yours. I'm just a steward. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, bless your people today. I speak the blessing of the Lord. 